Good morning, waterfowlers. As introduced, my name is John Humphreys. I'm with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm assigned to an area referred to as the Submerged Lands and Environmental Resources Coordination Program out of the agency's headquarters in Tallahassee. Uh, my primary area of responsibility, at least since this past April, is providing um, guidance, as, as alluded to during the introduction, specifically ensuring that everyone in the state, both the public and private sectors, are applying the mitigation rules and regulations in a uniform and consistent way. To that end, what I'm here to talk about today um, is mitigation and mitigation banking in Florida, and I hope to provide in the next few minutes just a brief overview of precisely what those mean. All right. So what is wetland mitigation? Mitigation is just the act of taking a wetland in one location and trying to compensate for its loss at another location. And we do that through creation, enhancement, restoration, or preservation of another area. And we, when we do this effort, we're trying to balance the functions and resources that are provided by the wetland to ensure that through time, we maintain a positive balance. We only want to undertake mitigation in those circumstances when there are unavoidable impacts. So before we even discuss mitigation, regulating community needs to ensure that there is absolute necessary that we um, have a loss at all. Protection is preferred to mitigation. Um, there are numerous laws and regulations in place to protect wetlands and other surface waters, but at a minimum, whenever an application for a proposed project comes in, to a regulating agency, the reviewer needs to critically evaluate that plan to see if there's any possibility that the specific proposed structures, infrastructures, or even access roads can be relocated. So as opposed to an access road, for example, bisecting a wetland, maybe that road could be moved so that it skirts around the exterior of the wetland, thereby reducing the amount of impacts. DEP's goal, and the state goal for that matter, is no net loss of wetland or surface water functions. Uh, please note that is a different goal than no net loss of wetlands or surface waters, period. The goal isn't so much to track the number of acres in the state of wetland and surface water, but rather to track the functions they provide, the processes that are going on in the background, the natural processes. And by functions, I mean those naturally occurring chemical, biological, and physical processes that serve to create and maintain an ecosystem through time. Things such as storage of water, um, atmospheric exchange, climate regulation, nutrient cycling, and fish and habitat assembly. That's what we want to monitor, that's what we want to track. In addition to assessing the level at which those functions might be taking place in an individual wetland, it's also important to maintain the same suite of functions from a loss to the gain on the other side to the mitigation project. Um, and to do that, the simplest method of approach is to ensure that we're doing a kind for kind or like for like replacement. So for example, if a project proposes to impact a cypress strand, for example, it's important that we replace that cypress strand with another cypress strand, as opposed to replacing that cypress strand with a freshwater herbaceous marsh, for example. We want to like for like, that way we don't have to account for individ individual type functions. We're making the assumption that the functions are comparable in both circumstances. Now in assessing the value of those functions, we have to have a formal process that's going to place a value on that wetland. Uh, because remember, we're not only tracking the total acreage or the total area of the wetland, we want to keep track a tab on those functions and processes that are occurring in the background. To achieve that effort, we have a standardized method, the Uniform Mitigation Assessment Method, that is to be applied to the wetland to assess its value. And the way that it um, pragmatically operates is through go actually going to the field, conducting an, inspe an inspection, and um, making note of any indicators that are on site. It's important to point out here that um, for mitigation purposes, Value means specifically the value rendered to fish and wildlife species. So many of you, are sh I'm sure, are familiar with the term ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is typically used to describe the benefits that humans derive from a wetland. Um, water filtration for drinking water, uh, protection from flood, etc. Mitigation does not consider those benefits. It does not consider ecosystem services provided to humans. Rather, it places its value on the um, providing 
functions to fish and wildlife habitat, and fish and wildlife specifically. Items such as ensuring that there's refuge areas, corridors for movement, um, and denning and nesting areas. I mentioned indicators as a tool or the instrument that we use to assess function in the field. And by indicators, I just mean those physical things that can be assessed in the field. We can go out and physically put our hand on the species that are present and make a list to estimate species richness or species diversity. We can go out and we can look at indicators such as elevated lichen lines or stain lines on a tree to, to verify that at some point in the past there was inundation at that location. We can examine soils. We can also take a desktop effort to assess the overall position in the landscape to uh, place value on overall connectivity for wildlife species, both um, at the specific species level and more broadly. Along with um, assessing landscape position, we want to ensure that there is hydrologic connectivity as well. So what the Uniform Mitigation Assessment Method does, or UMAM for short, is it takes into account this value assessment that we perform in the field. It plugs that into an equation along with the total area, the acreage, the spatial extent of an area. And they can also consider additional factors, such as um, for a mitigation project, for example, a restoration project, we have to weigh in the risk of failure for that project. We also have to weigh in the time lag that's associated with that restoration. Um, ecological function doesn't return overnight. It doesn't return as soon as those project-specific actions are undertaken in the field. Rather, like all ecosystems, they take time to develop and mature. So towards that end, what we have done is established a currency for wetland value. Generally, it's referred to as a credit, and it's the outcome of this equation that balances and weighs the value to fish and wildlife with the total acreage available and the risk factors and so forth. Now, it's important to keep in mind that we're still talking about two different aspects of the mitigation role. We have on one side a loss of function associated with an impact or development. On the other hand, we have a mitigation project where we're trying to replace those lost functions. So, for example, in the instance of an impact, we would go to the field, take a look at all the hydrologic indicators and other evidence that's present, that is present, and assign a value. Um, for um, simplicity, we can say we can assign a value on a scale from 1 to 10. And let's say we do that, we go to the field, we locate a system, and we give it a 5, an average score. That's considered the current condition. That's what's actually on the ground today. If in the future that area is proposed to be wiped out or impacted due to a development project, that five points, that five credits is going to be lost. So if it's going to go from an ecosystem functioning at a level five to a parking lot, we've lost five credits. So it's up to the folks responsible for conducting that construction or development to go out and locate or replace five credits somewhere else. And they do that through mitigation. Um, Creation of wetlands, establishing wetlands where there previously were none, restoration, bringing back in a historical condition, enhancement, uh, maintaining the same type of community but improving it through um, elimination of invasives, planting additional species, et cetera. And just to emphasize once again, if the area being impacted is, for example, one acre in size and is, say, an optimal condition of 10 on our UMAM scale, we have to go and compensate for that somewhere else. If we find another wetland, also one acre in size, but it's not a 10, that is not enough mitigation. We need either a larger area or a higher quality system, or both. So once we have identified the necessity for a loss, we've identified some options and calculated how many credits we're going to need to respond to that loss and balance it out, an applicant that is proposing a specific development has options as to how he can go out and replace those credits or achieve those credits. Firstly, they have the option of performing what's called on-site mitigation. In that instance, what happens is sometimes if there's a big, large property and only a small portion of it is going to be developed, they can place a conservation easement or perform enhancement activities on the remaining portion of the property. It's all in the same location. Develop half, protect half. 
that would be considered on site. And that would be handled by either the applicant, the actual property owner themselves are capable of doing this, there's no certification requirement, um, or they would hire an environmental consultant to actually go out and do the physical work. The other option, or the second option, is off-site mitigation by the applicant. In this case, perhaps that specific project-specific piece of property isn't large enough to both hold the scope of the project and provide mitigation or enhanced value down the road. So in that instance, they need to go out and locate another property they have rights over to conduct mitigation off-site at a different location. They have that as an option. However, there are specific guidelines to ensure that whatever mitigation it is, it's at least maintained in the same water basin or in the same regional watershed to ensure that we don't have a cumulative loss of wetland functions over time. So for example, if there was a project here in Marion County and there was going to be an impact, it's important to maintain those functions here locally as opposed to doing mitigation in the panhandle somewhere. And then the third option, which is um, the simplest option for the individual applicant or developer, is to purchase mitigation credits directly from a mitigation bank. A mitigation bank is an organization that as a business model develops and produces wetland credits, wetland and other surface water credits, specifically for the purpose of sale. They do this by purchasing a large piece of land and conducting enhancement and restoration activities through time on a continuous process. Um, in order to do this, of course, it requires permits because there's physical alteration of the landscape. There is hydrological alteration. There is an installation or removal of water control structures. There is supplemental planting of species, perhaps, or removal of species. And they would come to the Department of Environmental Protection as well as the Army Corps of Engineers and federal partners to obtain the necessary permits to do so. And those permits have certain attributes to ensure that the work is done properly. These are some of the attributes. First of all, there is a mitigation plan. So there has to be a very specific plan in place where the proposed mitigation bank is giving a very detailed list of the actions they're going to undertake for every community that's on that piece of property. It's going to include any alteration to the natural hydrology, um, any restoration of the original hydrology, supplemental planning, actually provide species lists and indicate where those species are going to be placed, a very detailed plan. They also have to establish a mitigation service area. The mitigation service area is the geographical extent to which their credits hold value. Just as with the offsite mitigation previously mentioned, it's important to main maintain that function in wetland in a close geographic proximity to where the impacts are actually taking place. So to that end, um, a mitigation bank can only sell credits within the same regional watershed or the same water basin. Typically, there are some exceptions where um, there's some disagreement over the watershed or basin extent. So up front, because they have this area, they have this detailed plan, they, they know exactly how many credits their property is worth currently as it sits on the ground today. And then contemplating their plan, the actions they plan to take to enhance or restore, they also have an idea of how many potential credits they can develop in the future through time as the system continues to develop. The types of credits they have is also designated. Once again, we want to ensure that is a like-for-like like or kind-for-kind kind exchange of function. We want to ensure that what's lost is what's gained. So included with their mitigation plan is a detailed list of specific habitats that are included. So if they, for example, they know the exact credits that are, relate to a forested freshwater system. They know the specific amount of credits they have for a herbaceous saltwater system. They know exactly what they have to sell. They have also established a specific schedule in conjunction with their mitigation activities, their proposed planning or hydrological restoration or alteration, they receive a certain amount of credits, a certain percentage of credits. They also receive a certain amount of credits for the initial establishment of a conservation easement or protection over the property to maintain that property in perpetuity. They provide financial assurance documents verifying that they have ample credit at a financial institution to undertake initial implementation activities, the supplemental planning and hydrological restoration, as well as ample credit at that financial institution to ensure long-term maintenance of the property, to maintain it in perpetuity. Once they finish their initial activities, their initial 
um, restoration project, that property will need to be maintained for um, natural fire frequency um, and for tracking invasive exotic species that might come in down the road. Although it's not specifically required by any law or legal requirement, more mitigation bank owners than not have opted to proactively include language in their permit as to permit access by the hunting community, specifically local hunt clubs. Uh, the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, hunting is an essential element of any quality wildlife management plan. Uh, and secondly, as I'm sure everyone in the room is aware, there is no one more willing and able to look after the best interest of a conservation project than an, an ethical sportsman. So a mitigation bank has several benefits over the individual applicant performing restoration on site or even off site. Firstly, there's more of a focus on restoration enhancement. Historically, the tendency has been that individual applicants that are pursuing mitigation on site or off site by their own direction, they tend to try to um, strive to reach the lowest level to satisfy the requirements. They don't receive any extra benefit or perk from excelling and going beyond and generating extra credits. They just want to maintain the minimum to, as to allow their project, as to permit their proposed wetland impact. Mitigation banks, on the other hand, are in the business of creating credits. So through time, they continuously strive to, do, to increase the value of the property. Size is also a big factor. Um, one of the few truisms in ecology, a, a relatively new science, is that there is a definable relationship between area and species. So the larger an area, there tends to be a greater abundance of species and a greater diversity of species. And because that area is larger, it also provides greater protection. It provides um, less edge effect because of its mass, a greater buffer from surrounding development. The ecological perspective that's maintained by the mitigation bank, this goes back to what Tim spoke about earlier this morning, maintaining the ecosystem perspective, that they're not there to restore or improve just one type of habitat. Their property exists as a mosaic of different types of habitats, different types of natural communities, different wetlands, different upland communities, and they exist in a matrix. And it's important for the mitigation bank to ensure a connectivity between all those different habitat types. Whereas an individual applicant would focus just on the particular community that they're impacting. Mitigation bank also provides a single point of responsibility. So if there's any issues that arise in the future, if there's any questions about the activities that are going on at the mitigation bank, whether it's a failure for some credit to be realized, um, whether it's a super ex excess of credits that are produced, there's one person you go to. If there's a financial issue, there's one person you go to, one point of contact. And as alluded to previously, they are invested in ecological results. The more improvement they generate from their property, the more credits that are produced. The more credits that are produced, the more credits they can sell. The more they sell, the more money they stand to make. Financial assurance. Uh, mitigation banks range in size from a few hundred to a few thousand acres. Um, that scope of restoration project requires substantial financial assurance. So mitigation bank has this credit that if anything should go awry, if there should be any problems in the future, they have this financial backing to go out and, and fix the situation or to move in a different direction if necessary. And they can go back and meet with the department or the regulating entity and renegotiate the terms of the original credit release schedule. And mitigation banks um, provide a more simple option for the individual applicant that is proposing a specific project development, as opposed to a property owner or a um, development representative going out and coordinating with a, a private environmental consulting firm and then monitoring the progress of that firm over time, uh, examining the property to make sure that it's in compliance and heading in the right direction. Rather than undertaking that complex, logistically complex effort, they could simply pay for the credits outright. They could pull out their wallet and pay for the credits from the mitigation bank. Here's a list of the current mitigation banks permitted by the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, 21 listed there. It's kind of difficult on that particular graphic to see the banks themselves. It's actually shown in red. 
but the blue area is the service area for the individual mitigation banks. So any impacts that occur within these blue areas could potentially be mitigated through purchase of credits from the mitigation bank that is permitted by the department. There are additional banks out there that are not permitted by the department, but are permitted by other regulatory agencies, water management districts, et cetera. These 21 mitigation banks in total encompass nearly 54,000 acres in the state. Um, the potential credits that these mitigation banks can generate through time within, the, say, the next 30 years is around um, 10,000 potential credits. So that's a, a, about a five to one ratio. So for every acre of loss, these mitigation banks will essentially uh, provide five acres of replacement. Now other than, as I mentioned, other than Department of Environmental Protection, mitigation banks are also those permitted by water management districts, which in total have 57 banks permitted for a 116, a little more than 116,000 acres and 21,000 potential credits. And of course, Florida is not the only state authorized to conduct mitigation bank activities. They are conducted throughout the nation in various states. Um, I didn't mention previously, but of course, this process, since it requires alteration of the landscape, since it re requires disturbance of the soils, there's also a concurrent process to acquire the necessary um, permit mitigation banking instrument from the federal government. I just happened to mention um, Vermont, New York, and Mississippi specifically because these three states happen to have um, mitigation banks that are operated by one of the foremost uh, conservation organizations in the country, Ducks Unlimited. If you could learn more about them on the Ducks Unlimited website. And I realize that was pretty fast and furious. I appreciate you all having me down today, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have.